Father, as we come to you today, <clears throat> the Bible is clear that it is in you that we live, breathe, move, and have our very being. You know us better than we even know ourselves. In our greatest moment of strength and victory, you know our vulnerabilities. And in our weakest moments, when we feel that life is overwhelming, physically, culturally, and socially, emotionally, and spiritually, even in those moments, we have you as our inner strength to enable us to endure all things through Christ. Father, we thank you for the fact that though our lives are always endangered in this fallen world, it is of your mercy that we are not consumed daily. You remember our frame that we are but dust, and you pity us as a father pities his children. May we recognize, Father, that your care for us does not always guarantee that life will be as we would like it to be. When the two things do not match, it is not a result of failure. It is the result of your purpose. And so, Father, we pray that you would give to each of us the spirit of a learner and of a servant in the midst of a world filled with all kinds of vulnerability. We know that Bob deals with many health issues, and now we have been reminded of this one that we have not even spoken of in a long time and almost forgotten. We just ask for grace and wisdom and mercy and whatever would please you most and bless him the most in this difficulty. We thank you for the fact that one day we will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We pray for Lee and the uh, suddenness of hearing of a medical need and now the options that are available and the choices that have to be made people who are involved in the need of wisdom for them to make a good, uh, to give good advice. Give her grace as she walks through this chapter. Give her encouragement that you are in control. Give her peace. We pray for this Lady Mary we know that she represents so, so many people in our community. We're in a vulnerable period of life. Just like cars wear out, decay has made its pathway into so many lives. We ask for wisdom and direction and help with regard to whatever is the root problem. We pray that not only will you do a work for her physically or emotionally and spiritually, but that through this she might be drawn closer to you. Every one of us on a daily or several times a week are used to hearing emergency vehicles and fire vehicles rushing into the area, recognizing that all around us there are people who are at the edge of eternity. We ask, Father, that you might keep us as vessels set apart for your use, and that we might be ready to give an answer to those who know us of our faith in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to the book of, actually we will be 
from the book of Genesis today rather than in it. And you'll understand why. Go back to Genesis 47, where we left off last week. I uh, would remind you that what happened in Genesis chapter 47 is we're now into the midst of the famine and we're seeing the famine take its toll on the nation of Egypt. And I introduced a couple of ideas last week that I'd like to build on. One of them I did last week, the other one today. Uh, verse 13, Genesis 47. Now, there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Pause. A little background for what we're going to talk about today. In your mind, develop the picture. Egypt is going into poverty. Pharaoh is getting wealthy. Pharaoh's power is increasing. And that's not that it's Joseph's motive, it's the inevitable result. Now, let me continue. Verse 15, so when the money failed in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us bread, for why should we die in your presence, for the money has failed? Then Joseph said, give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. Pause. How many of you have been to a going out of business sale. Mm -hmm. All of us. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. Last summer, I can remember one of our neighbors in our building spoke to my wife and I and said, you need to get up to, and there was a store two blocks down the street. She said, go in there and just get what you need. My wife and I walked out with, I'm going to guess, looking back on it, two bags full of groceries. We paid, in essence, a penny on the dime, a dime on the dollar. Now, when we walked out, we did not say to each other, I sure do feel sorry for these owners. It never entered our mind. So, let me point out something. Even though the land is in famine, and even though Pharaoh is getting an advantage at this point, remember, he will eventually have to give grain to the people so they can continue to try and farm as they are able. He is getting wealthy, but not only is he getting wealthy, do you know what happened to the livestock? The livestock that he purchased it had to be cared for, and Pharaoh wasn't really interested in being a herder or interested in being a, a rancher. It ended up in Israel's hands. So Pharaoh's getting advantage, Israel is getting advantage, the Egyptians are suffering. The reason that I mention that is because I think sometimes our perspective is so distorted that we call good bad and bad good. The scene that I want to present today is that you see poverty and you see prosperity set in contrast to one another. And we see it all the time in our culture. All of us are well aware of the fact that whether it's a politician or well-known actor or the CEO of a corporation, there are people 
who are taking advantage of society as a whole, and they are financially increasing. At the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who are starving, people who become homeless, and it's not always because of wrong they have done, but they are suffering. And so it brings up a real question that I think there is confusion in the church. When you read the Old Testament, you almost get the impression that wealth is always the result of God's blessing. God told Israel in Deuteronomy that he would grant them wealth as his blessing. Abraham was wealthy in his own way. So our minds sometimes get the twisted view in a materialistic culture that you can equal financial stability right with God, blessed of God. I find it interesting in the New Testament you will never find that wealth is the blessing of God. I'm not denying that. I'm not even arguing that. I'm saying there's an entirely different perspective. Do you know how God rewards the believer in the New Testament? Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Adversity is the blessing of God in the New Testament. Having it rough, life being tough, I mentioned last week as we started, and I'm laying groundwork, because once we get going, this will move very quickly through your notes. But I mentioned last week the statement that was made by Mark Twain. Sacred cows make good hamburger. And the reason I mentioned it is because there are things that are believed that really are not true. So what I want to today do is broaden our perspective on the subject of money, wealth, poverty, in relation to faith. Looking at the screen, you'll notice this background is in red. Anytime you see red, it will not be in the notes that were handed out. I try to limit those notes to basically four pages. I figure if you can handle four pages, you've succeeded a lot. But if I were to give you everything that I have here, it would probably be six pages. So please pardon the fact that this guy has not learned to count yet. I never have. But what I'd like us to consider is this question. Money in relation to faith, and we almost whether we really admit it or not, we look at money at one end of the spectrum, faith at the other, and never the twain shall meet. This is the world, I'm sorry, this is God, and this is the world. But then we have down here the problem all of us deal with every day, prosperity or poverty or possibly another alternative. Looking at your notes, if you would please, I have expanded that. The biblical view is not, and let me stop, I'm interrupting myself here, but you'll notice this number, if you look at your notes, it follows right from here to the end with numbers when it's in your outlines. The subject is money and faith. It is not money or faith. Just for a simple perspective, out of the 38 parables that Jesus gave, 16 of them dealt with money. When you read the Bible, there are 2,325 verses on money, but there are only about 500 on either faith or prayer. Now, we talk about the Christian faith, 
And automatically what comes to our mind, the important character quality, grace work of God, faith, and the personal practice of prayer. Yet Jesus and the Bible as a whole give a lot of attention just to the subject of money, whether wealth or poverty. Many years ago, I attended and then eventually taught a course from Larry Burkett. Do any of you remember that name? Yeah. Yes. Larry Burkett was the, in principle, guy before Dave Ramsey. Mm -hmm. Dave Ramsey is the follow-up to Larry Burkett. Larry Burkett wrote a number of books on the subject of finances. Luke 6, uh, 16, verse 12, and that's the basis of this statement that I'm about to draw your attention to. Not in your notes. But in Luke 16, 12, Jesus said, if you have not been trustworthy in handling wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And the point of the verse is this. If I can't be trusted with a task, if I can't be trusted with a little bit of money, if I can't be trusted with just the slightest amount of power, which is what money gives us, then I really cannot be trusted with the greater thing, the power of God to work through me. Therefore, the conclusion would be this. My control in financial matters is a direct reflection of my discipline or faithfulness in spiritual matters. In other words, I have to be able to handle money in order to handle scripture. Not that the two are the same. The character quality of being a dependable steward, the character quality of being a true servant, the character quality of actually learning to submit to God in my stewardship of wealth affects my stewardship of Scripture. This is in your notes, so notice this next. And by the way, we will not be turning much, if at all, today. I've tried to include all of the verses in the notes that were necessary. I want to lay this groundwork because I think it's important. Wealth has no morality and there is no virtue in poverty. You will meet degenerate poor people as well as depraved rich people. Stop for a moment. I'll pick it up here. I think it's important that when we have all of the immigrants pouring into our country, and I understand there are so many mixed motives, but we almost have developed an underlying attitude that all of us need to be careful about. Are they depriving me of riches? Or are they reflecting my love of money is greater than my care for people? That's why I've laid this as part of this. I'm pulling a bunch of things together. Now, to clarify, the issue is not the presence or absence of money, but the obsession and preoccupation with ourselves over others. That's the issue at stake. It is my view of people and my view of God reflected in my attitude toward myself. Wealth is about more than money. 
image here is purposeful. It is lots of money, but wealthy, but in bondage. Wealth is also about people and time and life. I can have all kinds of money and abuse my time and abuse life and abuse people. This is probably where I think the church has gotten into trouble. The church has focused so much on giving. In essence, almost implying that tithing, which I am not convinced is New Testament. But giving is a way of taxing people. And I think it's important to clarify it's not. God's first concern is not 10% giving, but 100% stewardship. In other words, God's concern is not what I give to the work of God. God's concern is all of it. And what happens is you have people for an illustration. Here's a multimillionaire that gives 10% and feels good about himself and then squanders and selfishly spends the other 90%. Okay, Julie, your hand went up. What's the difference between giving and tithing? The term tithe means 10%. It is the amount. God told Abraham that he was, no, Abraham chose. It's not God told Abraham. Abraham, out of whatever led him to come to the conclusion, previous teaching, historical practice, some kind of understanding God was pleased, he entered into a partnership with God by giving 10%. But the New Testament doesn't talk about 10%. That is not a New Testament principle. And do you know why? Now that I've opened up Pandora's box, before I go any further, why? Because we, our reward is, is grace given to us by our salvation. We don't, we don't get grace by our works or given money. It's by our faith. That, that is true, but what else would be true? How much did the average Jew give in the Old Testament? 10%. How much? 10. 10%. 10 that's what I was hoping you would say. That's not true. That's not even true. This is going to surprise you. In the Old Testament, they gave three tithes. 10% three different times, and they're all in the book of Deuteronomy. They gave what we know as the normal 10%, which supported the temple. You see, you didn't have 70,000 church buildings. You had one central temple and one priesthood. So you gave 10% for that. But number two, you gave 10% for the support of the priesthood, which was scattered all over the country, and for the festivals, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. But you realize that the temple and the priest didn't consume that. You did. There was a return actually on your giving. It was stored up. And then you had a support of the widows and orphans every three years, another 10%. If you look at it in one sense of the word, all of the giving in the Old Testament was almost national. It was like a tax once the nation was established. When we come to the New Testament, there is an entirely different approach no temple to support. We've got far too many bishops and archbishops to support. We have a lot of people in the ministry that I'm convinced never should have come into it. 
It has become a career instead of a calling. It has become a business position instead of a shepherding position. That's part of the depravity of man and part of the apostasy of the last days. Let me not run too far with this. Let me stay with the notes just so we're together because this will come back up again. Notice Proverbs 10, 22. The verse states, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. But notice these last words. And he adds no trouble to it. How much agony, how much anxiety, how much conflict has come by wealth that we have obtained or attained. And we call it the blessing of God because of the amount. But the blessing of God, when it really comes, comes clean. There is no negative attachment. So I want to draw some contrasts. Those contrasts are three key words that I think you need to put in the back of your mind. Number one, contentment. Contentment and satisfaction are not one and the same. Contentment comes from the confidence that God has or will, if needed, God has or will provide what we need. It's just the inner peace. I don't need to worry about it. God will take care of it. The conflict. Notice, if you will, this next screen. Here are the two struggling areas. Number one, financial frustration, which is the tension that comes from not applying God's perspective, principles, and priorities. By the same token, financial freedom, the confidence that I have applied the proper perspective, the biblical principles, and God's priorities. Let me tell you two stories of people in the church that I pastored last in Michigan. One day, I had a young couple come to the church. Their daughter was probably 18 months old. She was an eye doctor, and he was the man in charge of all the business portion of her practice. After the service, he sat down in the lobby, and we had a couple of benches out there. And he sat down beside me after I greeted people, and he said to me, very simply, he said, if the church had received money for missions, what would you do with that money? I said, I have news for you. It could never go anywhere here but missions. It is written into all the financial policies and in, even into the Constitution. He said, my wife and I are considering leaving the church that we are at right now. And the reason we're considering is because the church got into a little bit of financial trouble because of some wrong decisions made by the leadership. And they simply went into the mission fund and by decision of the board, shifted all of that money to missions. I said, no. That would not happen here. Now, I did not know what would come out of that. My wife will testify what I'm about to say is true. They joined our church. They today have three children. I suppose that oldest girl is what, 10, 12? Yeah, she's got to be about 10 or 12. They have for seven or eight years every month given somewhere between five and fifteen thousand dollars a month to missions did they have to no how many young couples 
would actually hold on to that money and advance themselves. I look back on it and I just, in my head, I have such high respect for him and for her. We had another man in the church. He was a graduate of Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan, which is a Christian Reformed school. Uh, it's far different than it was when he was there. One time he became the Dean of Students, then he moved to the East Coast, president of a college there, became a part of a consulting firm. In his own way, was very wealthy. I say was, still is. His wife is deceased, but he still is. There came a point that Western Seminary was looking for the possibility of building a prayer chapel. No, I'm sorry, chapel. That's all that it was, a chapel, next to their student center. And he went to them and he said, I'll give you $10 million for that chapel with one caveat. Make it a prayer chapel and put prayer benches in it. Make it a place of prayer. I have seen him give thousands upon tens of thousands of dollars over the years and no expectation of return. I asked him one time, because of these principles, I said, I almost said his name, friend, I said, uh, let me ask you a question. What are you doing this for? Is it for your ego once you're gone? I mean, I didn't say that, but that's a natural. What is his motivation? He said, no, it's because it's not mine. God simply said he wanted me to be the tool to get done what he wanted done. When you look at biblical finances, the issue is never amount. The issue is stewardship. Every single dollar. So that brings us to the basic general principle of financial planning or what we call a budget. You know what a budget is, don't you? A budget is your way of telling your dollars where to go instead of asking where they went. You take proactive role in determining what you're going to do with what God has put in your hands. So, let me give you some basic biblical principles. Number one, you need to establish a living plan. You said, what do you mean by a living plan? You need to decide what your lifestyle will be, not look back and discover what your lifestyle is. It's an advanced choice. Proverbs 27, 23. The Bible says, be diligent to know the condition of your flocks and well supervise your herds for riches are not forever. In other words, two things to keep in mind. Riches are always subject to being lost. That's just a reality in the fallen world. And number two, riches always come to an end. If you talk to financial planners, they will tell you few people make short range plans. Almost no people make long range plans. 1 Peter 3 and verse number 3. The Bible tells us that those women in the church who had faith like Sarah were not to be known for how they placed jewels in their hair and their hairstyle. In other words, an extravagant lifestyle, fashion, that is not characterized by extravagance, but humility is what God intended. Many years ago, I came from a background very conservative, and at some point, my wife and I decided that it was wrong for her to go to church and not wear a hat. Of 
Of course, God gave her her hair for her covering. I understand that. Now, so I would buy a suit and I would buy a nice outfit for her and it always had a hat. Do you realize it wasn't any time at all to where we created a fashion for our church? And then I began to realize, what am I doing? Is this really what God intended? We wear ties. I've worn a tie the whole time I pastored till the last day. I see a pastor not in a tie and I'm not comfortable. But by the same token, listen to what I'm about to say. Ties are an extravagance. It's not necessary. It doesn't serve a purpose of utility. And the point is that we have lost what ought to be characterized as humility in the assembly of God. Number two, establish maximum goals. Maximum goals? Take your Bible and turn it to Luke 12. I would like you to see this passage. Luke chapter 12. What do you mean by maximum goals? I am saying that when it comes to our lifestyle, we need to decide we're not going to this level. My wife and I, when we moved here, had two cars. My wife said, we need two cars. I said, what for? Well, you're going one way and I'm going another. I said, no, we're going together. <laughs> I kid you not. We had this discussion. Now, maybe you haven't. But, you know, and we have a nice car. But the point is, that came out of a decision of, we don't need that. And there's many other things that we don't need. I have clothes in my closet right now from the years that I passed her, almost dreaming that I might be able to use them again. And I look on television, and I look at churches around here, and I say, what are you waiting for, dry rot? <laughs> I mean, I, I am bewildered. Sometimes decisions are not that easy to make because of emotions. Well, Jesus, in Luke chapter number 12, if you have your Bibles turned there, mm -hmm. Jesus gave this warning. Look, if you will, at Luke chapter 12, and notice, if you will, please, verse 15. And Jesus, he, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Pause. Do you know that the first sin that was ever committed was the sin of covetousness? Adam and Eve in the garden were not satisfied when God said, you don't need that, you have this. And they took the fruit of the tree. The root of so much that goes on in life is the struggle for money, which is the struggle for power. People who love money don't love green, they don't love paper, and they don't necessarily love gold and silver. They love what power it gives them. Listen to this in verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Note rich. Note plentifully. Verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will go down to the local city mission and I will provide for the needs of the, oh, I'm sorry. So he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and they'll greater. 
And there I'll store my crops and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Two or three things to note there. Number one, wealth is about primarily, verse 19, love of ease. Notice, if you will, love of pleasure, drinking, and being merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then, whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In our culture, there is a struggle to be topped off. Peak of the pyramid financially. Proverbs 21 verse 20 reminds us, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. In other words, the fool is the man who is concerned about everything he can get and enjoy it. I remember a statement that was made by John Wesley. Get all you can, can all you can get. Basically, preserve it. And that's not necessarily a biblical perspective. I look at our culture and I see these things. We are addicted to self-indulgence. When I make this statement, I hope I do not embarrass you, and I hope I don't offend you. But go to the mall and sit down and look at what's happened to the bodies of Americans. We buy excessive insurances. I need this insurance, and then I need to cover it with that insurance, and then I need the umbrella insurance. We're overinsured to protect against the possibility of loss. We store useless assets. We're hoarders. Pause. If I took you to our condo and walked through our condo, you would say, honestly, you don't need that. You don't need this. You don't need the other. We are all hoarders. My grandmother was probably the poorest person I ever knew. And one time I went behind her bed when she was gone and pulled out boxes of rotted curtains for 20 years in those boxes. Clothing that belonged to my dad who had been dead for 10 years. And I burned them because they weren't necessary. And for the only time in my life I got cussed out by her and that was it. But we're all that way. And we all spoil our children and grandchildren. I love my family, but I'll tell you right now, my wife and I have talked about it. When it comes to watching our great-grandchildren at Christmas, I am horrified. Yes. Absolutely horrified. And I don't know where this will go as time goes on. Someone, it may be Larry Burkett, it might be Dave Ramsey, I do not remember, said this. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. First Timothy 6, beginning at verse 6 and continuing through verse 10. The Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. It doesn't say, but godliness with contentment is comfortable as a lifestyle. Godliness with contentment, even if the world is falling apart, you've got your act together. That's the point. If we have food and clothing, <coughs> let us be content. Verse 9, those who, and the King James, old King James, has the word will, New King James renders the word wish. It is actually the word thelema. Those who yearn, desire, have a passion to be rich. 
fall into temptation and a snare, a trap. And many foolish and harmful lusts, and I will develop this in just a moment, that plunge men to ruin and destruction. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. The Bible says very clearly it is the love of money. And you may have the love of money and not have any. Well, why is it that my neighbor has the nice boat for the water and the nice house to live in and I don't? What do you think that that is? That's covetousness speaking out of your mouth. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. In fact, it's so degenerate that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many griefs. We have done damage to ourselves because we have money. So, let me take a moment in your notes and just talk about four or five things that we need to be aware of. Why do we accumulate? Because we go to a financial advisor, we go to a financial planner, and we get advice that we are to save because of life's uncertainties. But let me just remind you of something. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said to lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where Moth and rust, dust corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. I am still vulnerable, even if I am saving. Do you ever shudder when you listen to the news and you hear in the news that there has been a breakthrough by a computer and all of the records that belong to your bank, to your credit card company, you cannot protect yourself ultimately. A second reason we acquire, because we envy. I was envious when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, Psalm 73, 2. Number three, America is mastering this, and so is China, and much of the Western financial world. It is a game. Remember, the top dog always wins, and it doesn't matter how you got there, who you trampled over, who you destroyed. Number four, we accumulate for protection. But what if, but what if, but what if? Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 50 for a moment. The 50th Psalm. Very interesting statement made by the psalmist. Not really one of those passages that normally just jumps off the page, but if you stop and think about it, it's a powerful tool in our arsenal. Psalm 50, beginning at verse 14. Offer to the God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. And then this wonderful promise when everything has fallen apart. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Our greatest protection is never in the bank, never in assets. It is in God. And then, number five, I'm just going to mention this right now, give. I mentioned a moment ago that we live in a culture with our mania to overprotect. In the many years that I pastored, I cannot tell you how many elderly people in the last decade of their life were concerned to leave for their children and children's children. Proverbs 13.22 says that a godly man, a wise man, leaves his children's children. But it doesn't mean he leaves them necessarily money to indulge himself. He leaves them a godly example. He leaves them the wisdom of his age. He leads, leaves them the power and influence of his life. 
I will say this, it is important to numeral three, laying the groundwork to come to this important principle regarding wealth and poverty. Every one of us needs, in our minds, and every couple, to establish a sharing plan. Larry Burkett says this, if I am earning, yet not sharing, it is certain I am not in God's will. Luke 6.38 says, give and it shall be given to you. I believe this is a Dave Ramsey quote, looking back. God redistributes to those seeking to sacrifice luxury to meet the needs of others. Sacrifice by its very definition is relative. I surrender a thing of value for a person that I have higher value for. Can I take a breath now? Yes. <laughs> Sharing, there's, there's a number of principles. You may want to write these verses down. I, that, I may have put them in the notes and I've just given the verses here. I can't remember. But, you say, why can't you remember? I just did it Saturday. <laughs> uh, but giving united the church together. It's what bonded them. They knew that, hey, you're in this with me. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions, goods, and they gave to everyone as he had need. And then Acts 4, 34 says, there was no needy person among them for those who owned, and again repeats that they gave. This is the same principle in 2 Corinthians. And now I'm going to come to Julie's question in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 8, regarding those who were in Europe, um, as Paul carried the gospel into Europe, they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. And they urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. And that's the critical foundation. It is surrender that always leads to giving. He goes on to commend them, at the present, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply your need then there will be an equality. In the church, and this is a sad tragedy, it's the American materialistic attitude. You have groups of wealthy and groups of poor, and they're almost as separated as Jewish men from Jewish women in the synagogue. That is not what God intended. God intended the church to be a loving body, family, congregation. And we've kind of lost that because our materialistic attitude and the famous individual, a rugged individualism in America has basically taken over the thinking of the modern American. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, Macedonia and Achaia, which is the same thing when we read 2 Corinthians, were pleased to make a contribution for the poor saints in Jerusalem. If the Gentiles share the Jews' spiritual blessings, meaning the Bible, the Gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, it came from them. They owe it to the Jews to share material blessings. In other words, there is a balance of giving and receiving. Now, let me say this. When you read of giving in the New Testament, are you ready for this? You never gave to an institution. It's not even in the Bible. When you read the New Testament, do you know who they gave to? Individuals who were poor. Number two, who do they give to? Those who who taught the Word of God. Several passages that teach the same thing. Number three, 
they gave to carry the gospel to the world. I don't know that I would say that God intended our style of Christianity, which is the same from Russia all across America. It's all of Europe. It's been the pattern in this part of the world. We have created institutions and organizations. Well, and Nancy, you may remember this. We had a missionary who retired from Africa. When he retired, he wanted to grant that local native people a church building. The church building was going to cost $8,000, and he was trying to raise it here in America. It was in our church at the time, it was close to the end, and we helped him to cross the $6,000 mark. He got ready to mail the money and found out it was going to have to go through the mission board to get there. And the mission board reduced it from $8,000 to $6,000. I'm sorry, it was $6,000. They raised it to $8,000 because they had to have their cut. Now, I'm not criticizing them, and I'm not naming the mission board. What I am saying is the American idea is not the biblical idea. And if I lived like the Bible taught me to, I would be running and butting heads all over the place because America does not think biblically. So what is the rest of the world? Well, when I was in Africa, when I was in South America, in other words, when I was in third world countries, it was a different feel. I think it's the materialism that has indulged the Western world and the modern world. But the point that you're making is a very valid point. Some people are concerned to leave a legacy. And obviously, part of that legacy is our work ethic. Solomon passed the field of a lazy man and it was overgrown, Proverbs 24, 30. By the same token, Paul blessed the believers in Acts 20 when he was at Ephesus and said it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's not about protection. By saving up money for protection, the severe evil that Solomon saw as a man's riches kept to his own hurt. There's some sins you cannot afford to commit without riches. Money can be an ego builder. It can build self-esteem. That's why Paul said, command those who are rich in this world's good. I'm going to try and jump to that screen and I'm not going to be able to. My mistake. Command those who are rich in this world's good, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in God, who gives to all men. And then he tells them they are to share, be ready to share, that they may lay hold of eternal life, not that they may gain it. That is not his point. The point is that they may live it. How I handle money is really a perspective on eternity. Is eternity really that real? Who deserves help? Five things that are mentioned in the Bible. Number one, those who cannot provide for themselves. Not will not. If any man will not work, he should not eat. Number two, government, family, not the government. We have given the government the authority that belongs to the family. 1 Timothy 5.8, if any man provide not for his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Those who are believers, 1 John 3.18, if we shut the bowels of compassion when we see another believer in trouble, God says that that's not confirmation that we are believers. Those who preach the word of God, not those who've made a career in the church. And finally, number five, the unsaved. How about poverty? Plutarch, very wise statement. He said, poverty is not dishonorable. 
only if it comes from idleness, intemperance, extravagance, and folly. Why are people in poverty? Possibility number one is indulgence. Proverbs 21, 17. He who loves pleasure will become poor. You squander it away very quickly walking through these. Sometimes it's a result of chasing. Samson made the mistake. The immoral woman, do not lust after her beauty, or let her captivate you, for the prostitute reduces to a, you to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress preys on your life. Who touches her will not be punished, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. Some people are poor because they have integrity, character. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Sometimes poverty is the result of God putting you through the test. In this case, this is the case of Job who lost everything in chapter 1, but his help he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return, depart. The Lord gave, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes it's not a test, but there is a redemptive purpose, and it's a voluntary poverty. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for his sake, to your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Proverbs 22, 7 warns us. We often look at credit, but the Bible says the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the servant to the lender. And let me say this. Take the first part of this statement. All of us know what it's like to see people who are in wealth intimidate, rule over, run over, ignore. That's the point. Proverbs 17, 18, a man lacking in judgment shakes hands. It literally reads strikes hands, but it's the idea of when two men shake hands in an agreement in pledge and guarantees or puts up for security as neighbor. And I'm going to turn to the last verses. Luke 6, 30, give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not command it back. And I think I'll stop there. Are there questions? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm just counting the number of people here. Julie, you're here. I, I just got like a statement that since my husband passed, I have plenty. But the biggest problem is, and you brought it up at the beginning, is stewardship. Because, you know, I got to figure out where to give some of this money. But like you said, there's so many institutions, like even in Maryland, they have a special gas tax for the roads. Then the political parties changed hands at the next election. They took the money out of the roads and spent it on something else. So the, the hardest part of giving away money is who are you giving it to, the stewardship of it. I have to be careful. James 1 5, if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God. I wouldn't make a decision until I've done my homework. You'll never go wrong if you do your homework and then you look to the Lord. No, not necessarily. Those of you in TV land, you'll just have to endure. You can't hear, and I'm so sorry. But her question very simply was, how do we handle the fact we don't know? All right, Wendell, very quickly. To answer her question, I wonder if your if the evangelical church pastor might be able to offer advice for that particular area. He might, but you're not gonna like what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna Go say ahead. it anyway. Go ahead. Your evangelical pastor might also want it for something he wants it for. I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, the other point I had was, yeah. you need about three or four hours for us to have a discussion on this whole subject. Yeah. So we may need to pick this up again. All right, there were two more hands I saw.
on the on the slide the dogma that you have for where to give those who cannot family believer convert shepherds and the unsaved. What did you say about the believer? First John three eighteen is the verse. First John three eighteen says, "If I see my brother in need, and I." King James idiom, it's an idiom, shut the bowels of compassion. I slam the door in his face. I refuse to help. How dwells the love of God in me? How can I really be a believer and not have pity in that situation? All right, Nancy and then Mary. I just wanted to add that after Larry was cast, uh, Crown Ministries yes. became directed by Howard Gacy. So Compass One Compass replaced Larry Burkett. I have in my Howard Dayton. Okay. I have it in our at our condo. I still have a stack of books on teaching stewardship. At least that high of workbooks from these organizations. All right, Mary, your last word. Um, yeah, the last scripture you shared was Luke six thirty. Give to everyone who asks, and it was like don't seek from those who have taken from you. Give, and it shall be given to you again. Press down, shaken. The image is that take a jar, fill it, press it down, and shake it. God is saying, I will assure you that I will be as generous to you as you are to others. That's the point. It's an image. All right? Very good. Have a good day. Good to see you. Sorry to take so long. If y'all, if, if you guys won't, we'll discuss this till supper. <laughs>